I suppose staying in the garden would have been a pleasant experience. There was every kind of tree beautiful to look at as you basked in the shade. Trees abundantly providing good food to eat. A lovely flowing river branched out into several streams winding through the garden, watering the land and providing plenty of water to drink. All kinds of delightful animals roamed the garden, wild animals, birds flying overhead, cattle, every living thing. And we get the impression, rightly or wrongly, that everyone got along just fine as herbivores, eating plants and not one another. The earth creatures, male and female, had meaningful work to do, cultivating and caring for the land, tending to the animals. The garden was a lovely place, really, where the woman and the man could enjoy extraordinary beauty, living in mutual, respectful equality with one another, in harmonious connection with all that is. But things happen. Times change. Decisions are made, shifting one's course. Life moves on. The woman and then the man decide to eat some fruit from a tree, giving them knowledge of good and evil, making them more like the divine in whose image they are created, reflecting the glory of God. Then God comes walking through the garden in the cool of the evening, wondering where the people are, and says, Where are you? What's up? Not certain their decision is going to go down so well with God, and maybe a little amazed and not quite so sure what to do with this newly found, suddenly acquired perspective, both the man and the woman are hiding, in, and I don't know about the snake. But soon the people do come out, and our understanding of human identity, those creatures created in the image of God, like us, is about to expand. Turns out, for the first time, they realize they're naked. Now, this may sound a little surprising to us, but I guess living in bliss without anything to worry about, everything provided for you, no prior knowledge of the real world, at least as we know it, maybe it is possible to miss things like this. And I suspect when the man and the woman saunter out, clad in sewn-together fig leaves, God knows that things are different somehow. Not only do the man and the woman now know that they're naked, they appear to have learned how to sew as well. So God asked the man, have you eaten from the tree I told you not to touch? And the man gives a nice, clear, direct response. It wasn't my fault, it was her fault, the woman. So God asked the woman, have you eaten from the tree I told you not to touch? And the woman gives an equally nice, clear, direct response. It wasn't my fault, it was the snake's fault. With no one else apparently around readily available to blame, the talking snake is sort of stuck. Now the story may sound fanciful, but this part sounds awfully familiar, don't you think? It isn't my fault. I'm not to blame. Someone else is the problem. Let them take the rap for this. I'm not responsible for the decision I made. At any rate, decisions were made, and we may think of the decision to eat the fruit as a fall into sinfulness, the beginning of original sin, like most of us have been taught through the years. Or we may think of these decisions as a fall up like we talked about last week, a fall up into greater understanding, becoming more like God, maturing into the fullness of our humanity, including the divine within us. A fall up as we take on our role as moral agents in the world, now that we can discern good and evil. Either way, decisions were made for which both the woman and the man were accountable, but failed to take responsibility for their own actions choosing rather to blame someone else as if they themselves simply had no choice. And so humanity misses the first real opportunity to be true moral agents in the world, true moral agents who take responsibility for the choices they make. Of course, 
There are always consequences of some sort for the decisions we make. One way to look at the story is that God punished the man and the woman and the snake for disobeying, and that's probably what most of us were taught. Another way to look at the story might be the woman and the man have to leave the garden because they made a decision to gain knowledge of good and evil. But then once they had this new knowledge, they refused to take responsibility for their own actions. Maybe they had to leave the garden in order to learn more about taking responsibility, to learn more about using their knowledge of good and evil to care for one another, to care for the world and all that's in it. Maybe the blissful, easy life of the garden is not where you can learn about responsibility. Now, of course, we have to remember how we got these biblical stories in the first place. Thousands of years ago, with an ancient world view, people sat around and looked around and talked, and they wondered, how did all of this get here? Why are things this way? How does all of this work, and what does it all mean anyway? And using, again, their best observational skills, their spiritual awareness, the most up-to-date knowledge that they had, and their understanding and reasoning, they told stories trying to explain answers to questions like, why do snakes slither across the ground? Why are we sometimes afraid of snakes and want to kill them? Why is childbirth, the creation of new life, painful? And women even die, especially back then or even now when there's inadequate prenatal care. Why does it seem acceptable in some places for men to dominate women? Why do people have to work so hard, often at jobs they don't like and that don't satisfy them and that may not provide an adequate living? And why do animals and people have to die? So partly, we got these stories that way. And we can look at them as an attempt to explain the reality of our ancient ancestors as they looked around and wondered and saw things much as we see today. And somewhere, as we think about this reality, somewhere deep in our souls, we know something is wrong. This reality that we see around us isn't quite right, not the way it's supposed to be, not what gives us life and sustains us, and we want to go back to the garden. We search for the garden. Our souls long to return to the blessedness of the good creation. Our spirits are parched and dry and starving, seeking for the refreshing garden to experience once again goodness and wonder, the blessed wholeness and connectedness of life. We want to return to the garden to find the blessed existence we believe is still possible, to discover the real joy we hope we can still find, to experience a connectedness to replace the brokenness we're experiencing. If we could just find out where to look, somewhere where life could be easier, where our responsibilities would be lessened. Some end up at resorts and spas, you know, those kind of places where everyone takes care of you, providing you with delicious, healthy food, energizing beverages, delightful experiences with little or no effort on your part, where the massage is waiting right after the relaxing swim in the cool, fresh pool, followed by the steamy sauna, where you can stroll in the colorful, fragrant, artfully landscaped garden in easy, calm relationship with your companions. A blessed existence, maybe even close to what you're looking for, except for the fact that you eventually have to leave, returning to reality as usual.